Um, the purpose of this talk is to give an overview of a few things. What it really is like to be an academic. Um, I suppose to a certain extent, what you have to do to succeed. And also, um, you know, we can think a little bit about what, what to do next, effectively, if it's, um, if it's something uh, that is interesting um, to think about. I mean, the first thing to say, I suppose, is that most lecturers have their PhDs, obviously, and um, the minority of academic roles, so, so, so most academics you come across um, will be focusing on research, although obviously there are other bits of jobs that we'll talk about. There are a few roles, fewer roles, in which the focus is primarily on teaching, on delivering innovative, interesting academic programs to students. Now, that's not to say that you don't do, do, do both, depending on the role that you're in, but there can be more of a focus on research, more of a focus on teaching. Um, um, the other thing to say, I suppose, is that, and this is, this is a, a quote from the Times Ed Supplement, which I was reading quite recently, which was talking about the fact that <clears throat> there's a significant credibility gap, quote unquote, between um, postdocs' expectations and the likelihood of their forging long-term careers in higher education. So the postdoc stage comes after the PhD stage. Uh, more, than, more than three quarters of staff responding to the Careers in Research Online Survey 2013 said they aspired to or expected to have a career in higher education as an academic, and around two thirds said they expected to achieve this, but the numbers say that this is pretty unrealistic to, to expect. So um, I guess that's sort of saying that, um, as in many competitive and interesting fields, that uh, many more people go into it and start out thinking they want to be academics than actually there are enough roles for. Um, so I don't think there's any kind of, I mean, it's not a huge, a huge surprise, but I think it's sort of worth, worth bearing that kind of thing in mind. So we're going to talk about what it takes to, to, to succeed in the field. Oh, that's just a picture of a beautiful picture of Oxford, which I thought might be nice to have in there. So, um, so, so I was going to sort of talk a lot about, or well, a bit about, what, what academics actually do, because um, I think there are some times um, it's not it's not actually totally clear what these guys when they you know they come and teach you and that's the content you have with them when you go and um, have a have a tutorial session with them but, but what are they actually spending their time doing so um, this comes from and again it's, it's kind of these are quotes from people I've talked to or people I've read about um, so <clears throat> well the university of there's a, a, a lecturer called Marine Quigley who talk, who writes a blog about being a, a lecturer um, in ethics and law. At the University of Bristol, and she says that says, as far as teaching is concerned, I mean, first of all, I think you, you've got to want to teach. You've really got to love not just your subject and be passionate about your subject and digging into your subject, but, but be passionate, I think, about sharing it with others in a way that they will understand. And she talks in some some depth about what actually goes on behind the scenes of teaching. Um, some of the things she said. So she she says. Um, so far, as it, so far as it is possible, al al academics are allocated subjects which they prefer to teach. Sometimes that isn't possible, in which case you might end up teaching something you're not that keen on. Whatever the teaching method you use, the teaching which you experience, which you as a student experience at the moment, is rather like an iceberg. Most of it is invisible to you. So the teaching that these academics are doing requires obviously knowledge, preparation and expertise, all of which is, requires unseen work. Even just to give a lecture which had been delivered the previous year, which requires updating, um, perhaps, per complete, um, perhaps complete rewriting, is an enormous amount of work. And added to that, the fact you've got to put stuff on to, uh, I guess, Helios here, um, other IT means, you've got to post that, you've got to update it, there are essays to mark, um, <clears throat> whether assessed or not assessed, and there are comments that need to be given uh, on the essays, and you know, so, so there, there's a hell of a lot that goes on behind the scenes. Then you've got the non-formal teaching, so teaching out, outside the curriculum continues in a variety of ways. She said, for instance, through email exchanges, uh, hundreds of email, you know, academics will typically answer hundreds of email, uh, student emails in the, just in the first part of the first um, semester of the first year. So, um, in addition to that, you've got obviously exam preparation, uh, assessment of, of, of exams, and then the whole area of postgraduate supervision as well. Most academics, she said, do some postgraduate teaching or supervision. Some do a great deal. Um, <clears throat> teaching on the taught postgraduate programs uh, attracts uh, similar considerations to those 
uh, previous out outlined, as in the, the, the amount of work, the emails, and the contact, and everything else. But then supervising PhDs um, is a huge commitment to guide the postgraduate student towards success and completion within the time limit of a thesis that's 80,000 words. So, I, mean, I mean, the point is here that, that, that you've got to like teaching. You've got to like the preparation, you've got to be excited about engaging with students at all levels, uh, you've got to enjoy kind of the coaching that will come with some of this. So there's that whole area that, um, I don't think it's that people forget about it, it's just that if you think about how much work that takes, that's a lot of your week, just there. What else do they do? And we come on to research in a second, which is the obvious one, but there's this whole area of administration. Um, so, so this is another quote from another academic user's name that I haven't written down, but anyway, um, I can find out really easily and, and, uh, and, and give more information about that later. But, but you know, he, he talks about the fact that when you're, you know, you're, you're, you're so you will be an academic advisor to your students, uh, you'll be on serving on, on committees and boards all over the place. And he says, so academics typically serve on committees in the following areas, staff meetings, teaching and learning, research policy, postgraduate teaching, undergraduate teaching, examinations, widening participation, staff student liaison, admissions committees, teaching strategy, room refurbishment, review of other teachers' teaching, appraisal assessment, the contents of the library, budget, finance, IT, blah, 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 blah. So, <clears throat> as well as advising students, putting in for funding research, uh, it's, it's, you know, writing applications, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, prepping for these meetings, writing references, talking at open days, reading new platform forms, having office hours. So that's, there's all that. And then, there's your research. Um, and I suppose the reason I've sort of put it this way around is that I, I mean, I've, I've literally heard, heard said that the research kind of slots in around these other things that actually which I kind of thought was, I guess, it's a bit of a surprise for me. I mean, I'm not an academic, but I, I, I sort of have the feeling that, that academics have the majority of their time doing their research. But actually, I think things are changing, and, and your, the demands on your time are, are so great. Um, and I sort of think that although, I mean, this is the difficult thing I think about, about becoming an academic, is that you want to spend time on your research, but you're going to be pulled away from it. Um, in order to, to grow and develop and, and progress your career, you've got to be publishing. That's how you're judged. But you've also got much more critical assessment nowadays by students on your teaching. Um, especially with fees going up, so students are that much more demanding. They're that much more expecting of decent contact time and teaching. So, yeah, it's um, <clears throat> not easy. Um, so, in terms of the research, I mean, I suppose some of this is going to be sort of obvious, but I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll run through it anyway. Um, this is again from a variety of different sources of academics I've talked to, what they say. <clears throat> so obviously most, most academics will be expected to contribute to scholarship and knowledge by conducting research and publishing the results of the world. Um, so publishing, and, and I think students are sometimes not, not that aware of what's going on behind the scenes, so publishing academic books, Obviously, journals, articles, chapters in books, um, reports sometimes published by official bodies. This depends what area you're going to go into. This guy's obviously in law, he talks about publishing connected to parliamentary committees and think tanks. Um, some, some academics manage large funded research projects which involve several different, so several different people from different universities, but you know, the sort of multifaceted collaborations um, which are uh, enormously complex and very time consuming. Indeed, considerable pressure is imposed by universities on academics to research and publish because research ratings are used to judge and compare universities and evidence of good research has historically been the main criteria for promotion to senior lecturer, read and professor. And that seems to be the, the way it, it, it is continuing for the moment, although <clears throat> I think there is a movement, I've heard about this in, in, in a few college, a few universities, to sort of try and bring your, your, your um, ability as a teacher into that process as well. Um, with the, um, oh yes, this is the quote that I've just made. So, so this is from the, the Man Manchester, uh, an academic from Manchester says, research can be pushed to the margins of your working life, 
which may extend into evenings, weekends, and holiday periods. However, as an academic, you are generally measured on your research, research success, so it's critical to retain a focus on advancing your research even in small chunks. So you can sort of see the, the pull and the, and the problems inherent in this, in this career. Um, the research assessment exercise, which is the RAE, with the research assessment exercise, most academics are required to publish, publish research which is reviewed formally by government appointed committees every five or six years. Um, this, uh, again, is written by an academic in, in law. Um, he just goes a little bit mad here with the numbers. He says, if you just think about writing a textbook, for example, of a thousand pages, that's about 500,000 words. Just to type out 500,000 words at a time, it's a to 30 words per minute, would take 277 hours. Anyway, he goes on and on, on, on like that for a little bit. But, but um, that, you know, the, the research is obviously where your focus should be, but the other calls on your time is where you're going to spend most of your day. Um, so it's it's an interesting one. I mean, I, I, just, I suppose this this it kind of gives an idea of, of what the, of some of the challenges I think that one would be up against. Um, so the academic path. Um, so obviously, you're you're starting with your bachelor's, typically go on to your master's. Um, after that comes the PhD, and we'll come back and talk a little bit about funding for the PhD. Um, after that, you tend to, there's, there's a sort of um, what you might describe as an uncomfortable transition phase, which is the postdoc phase. Now, depending on the field that you're in, um, depending on um, luck or um, contact or whatever it happens to be, you could do one postdoc in a lectureship, but typically it would be more than one, and that does require a degree of flexibility. So that means that you, you could do a postdoc here, but then you might have to travel up to Edinburgh to do your next postdoc. So, so is that, there, there's that, that, that in-between phase where you are not a permanent employee of a university, you've got a contract that could be one, two, three years. Um, I think that can be very challenging for, for um, many young aspiring academics because obviously you know that's probably between the ages of 25 and 35 there are other pressures on you to put at those ages do you want to be moving around all the time do you want to settle your life down do you want to have a family blah 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 all this kind of comes into it um postdocs you do your postdocs your one or two or three postdocs however many you need to do and you hopefully will land a position as a as a lecturer um, Leading to senior lecturer, leading to, to, to sometimes there is this position called reader and then and then um, professor. So that is the, um, the, the the general career path. Um, should we talk a little bit about funding? Okay, so how on earth does one fund the PhD now? Funding, okay, so this works in a few different ways. If you are one of the lucky, I think, something like 15%, so I'm just going to shut the window. There's some singing going on that side. So, about 15%, I think, of the statistics of, of, of um, PhD students will get a full scholarship or studentship. So, this is <coughs> where the university funded by one of the research councils, I think there are about seven research councils, um, I suppose the one most relevant here might be the Arts and Humanities Research Council. The research council will give the university money to do a certain area of research. If you are, as I say, fortunate, you can get a full studentship or scholarship in which your fees are paid, so the PhD fees are paid for, and your living expenses are paid for. Um, a friend of mine is doing a, a PhD, she's on a full studentship, I think she gets about 18,000 a year. That's on top of the fees. Okay, so li very little. Well, depends where you live. Not very little, but little. Okay, thank you, Alex. Um, but most people are not going to are not going to get that. They, it's, it's always worth applying. If you see them advertised, I think jobs.ac.uk um, or, or I mean, your, oh, sorry, university websites, yes, of course you're going to go for those. But if you don't get your full studentship, you don't get your full scholarship, what are you going to do? 
<clears throat> okay, so at that point, you are, what I see is, is, is you, you're putting together bits of money. You can certainly apply for a grid open loan um, <clears throat> if you're eligible for it. Um, sorry, let me just go back to the, 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 the student chip for a second, just because I, I have an example of, of, of student chip. So this was from the London School of Economics. Um, this is what they're currently saying for 2014 entry. So the school is offering um, 59 full scholarships for, for new PhD students. The scholarships cover fees and living expenses of 18,000 each year for four years. Uh, available for home, UK, EU, and overseas students undertaking full time research in any LSE discipline with annual renew renewal subject to satisfactory academic performance at the school. So, in other words, you've got to keep your standards up. Um, students are awarded on academic merit and research potential. So that's what they're going to be looking for in your application form. Does your research, your research interests fit with what the school is, is doing at the moment? Um, uh, do you have ideas for collaborations? That kind of thing. Um, okay, so that's just a, what, an example of, of the studentship and, and, and how you, uh, so then you apply through LSE. Career development loans come from the bank. Um, the bank loans to help pay for courses and training to help your career. You can borrow, borrow between 300 and I think up to about 10,000 and then you will pay back at reduced interest. If you're lucky enough to work, you can always approach your employer and see if they might help out part-time and, and of course you, you might want to be working alongside doing part-time work. But the really interesting thing, and as you're the only person here, I'm going to give you this, is I think looking into um, alternative funding. Um, this is, uh, it's called the Alternative Alternative Guide to Postgraduate Funding, and it, I'll, I will email you the uh, full booklet, but this has got some of the charities and trusts. And it's really interesting because if you're willing to do the work, you can get funny little pots of money from all sorts of different ch charities and trusts. So, for instance, I mean, I don't know how much you know about them, but this, all this, so this is about 34 pages of charities and trusts. I mean, just to open a couple, um, so, okay, there's one here for, for um, these aren't going to be relevant to you, but let me tell you anyway, okay, so, so, grants for overseas students wishing to study engineering, um, grants for education, research, music and dance, uh, grants for education, research, music and dance for students studying the culture, tradition and heritage of Greece, um, students under the age of 40 who live in Herefordshire. So in other words, you could probably go through here and find two or three um, that grants for people living in Egham, in Surrey. I mean, it's very sort of strange little, little bits of money that you wouldn't necessarily know existed. Um, now, when I first started looking, what I'd heard is, oh, it's just tiny, tiny, tiny bits, like £100 here, £100 there. It's not all tiny. I mean, you can get, you know, I'm just looking on this page, up to 4000 um, 2000 you know, and if you start putting together enough of those, you've actually got quite a nice little, little, um, well, not a nest egg, but you've got, you've probably got enough to fund at least some of your study, and you, then you can patch together the rest maybe with a loan or with uh, doing some part-time work. Um, I was reading the blog of a, a, a guy who's a postdoc um, who, who said that he, I mean, it's almost a full-time job, but he, he got 40 different bits of money from different charities. And with that, he came out without any, without any debt and with his PhD. So, I'll give that to you. Um, So, does that give you a bit of help with the... Yeah, never mind. No, you've already, you've already been through the, the, the master's application. I, mean, I was just going to say a little bit about, about studying for postgrad. Um, I think this, this is more, more at the master's level, really, but, but so just for the purposes of the film, some of the things you want to cover when you're applying to postgraduate study, why this course, why this kind of research, why this subject and why this university? So you need to be addressing all these. If you're asked about these in a personal statement, if you're asked to write a personal statement, this is what you need to cover. Why are you interested in this particular um, area of research? 
why are you interested in doing it at this particular university? What academic skills have you got to, uh, are you going to bring to the to the um, to the program to your research? So this could be relevant te research techniques. It could be um, relevant IT skills. Um, what personal skills can you offer? So these are things like teamwork, communication skills, working under pressure, um, resilience, uh, overcoming obstacles. What are your strengths? So it, I guess this, this is kind of looking at in what ways do you think you are better than other candidates? And really what makes you better than other candidates is the combination of skills, experiences, and strengths that you have. Um, that's what sets you apart. I mean, a lot of people are going to say that they've got good communication skills, but maybe not everybody can say that they've got particular kinds of communication skills, again, for particular kinds of experience. So you've got to think about the, the, the combination of things that make you unique. Um, the relevance of your first degree to this kind of study and your master's, if you're going to do it for a, a, a doctorate. And, and your career aims. I mean, I think it's also important to address where you're going to take this. And, and it might be that you don't know exactly where you're going to take it, but I think it's important for the, um, the people who are reading your application and interviewing you to understand that you've thought through where this might, you know, where this might go. Because if you have a plan, you're more likely to stick it. I think it's as simple as that. So they, they probably want to see where you, where you, you know, what your plan at the moment is for your future. A little while ago, we talked about the academic career path. But I've also come across a couple of um, these are blogs, but I've also kind of picked up from academics themselves who say there are that, you know there are some harsh truths about the academic career. The first one is there is no academic career path. Um, what does that mean? This is from um, the, the blog of an academic called James Dayton, and he says there is no academic career ladder. It is a pyramid, and it's crowded at the top. Most post most postdocs never progress to permanent positions simply because there are fewer available, um, and there are more people trying to get into that top tier than are retiring or dying. It's one of those kind of professions. It's certainly possible to get up there, but it takes determination, which means being certain that is what you want. Which is the point I make repeatedly that you know being clear about that, that this is really what you want. You're going to you have the skills, you have um, you've thought it through, you know exactly what the life of an academic entails really important. He says, the question to ask yourself is this, do you ever wake I guess I couldn't say this is true of me, but do you ever wake up early because you are excited by the prospect of getting published in a good journal? <laughs> We're looking at each other. Um, if so, that's a good sign. But I suppose that's uh, an interesting way of thinking about it. The second thing he says is that work and hard and being smart is not enough. Lots of other people are as smart as you and just as hard working. Um, so how can you get ahead? And, and it's the same sort of message, I think, is, is he saying you have to know what you're aiming for, set yourself a target and a time frame, and make the decisions necessary to get you there. So he says if you decide before your first, first postdoc that you are aiming for a permanent position by the age of 32, that gives you a framework for making decisions. So I suppose it's a pragmatic approach when you want to be in that first permanent position. It gives you something to push for. And the third thing, which I've heard many, many times from many different um, academics, are is I think publishing is, is, is the lifeblood of your career. You must publish, but also this thing about contacts. Contacts are the lifeblood of your career. <clears throat> Academia is no longer a career that takes you safely out of the mainstream of life, you can sit in your ivory tower and do your research, isn't it nice, and once in a while go to a dinner with lots of other academics and that's all you have to do the rest of the time you can focus on your research. It's just not like that. You have to be networking, meeting people, meeting people to collaborate with, picking up gossip, going to conferences, um, uh, you know, writing with other people, presenting with other people. It really, in many ways, it's, it's a career in which, in which Networking, I think, is, is almost even more so than, than, than many other careers at the forefront of, of success. Um, I mean, apart from anything else, you know, if you know someone and, and they like you and 
you apply for a job and they're on the interview panel, then they're going to want to, you know, they want to get you in. And I mean, just little things like that. But but absolutely hugely important. Got to, you've got to be willing to, to network. And even if you're not somebody who networks naturally, I think if you're really driven to do something, you will do it. But it is something to bear in mind. Really critical. So coming on to the end now. But skills you will need as an academic. So we've talked about networking. Um, a few more tips. On networking, and this is to the, this is actually sort of an academic who's talking to people with PhDs or postdocs. So start to develop your own professional network if you are a PhD or postdoc member of staff. See if your PhD supervisor or your or manager is prepared to share some of their own network with you. Attend conferences. Make yourself known, known to other um, researchers on academic online networking sites. Make sure that people know you. Okay, I'll say probably on that. Um, time management, I think it's probably an, ob an, an, an it's obvious. We talked earlier about this massively wide um, number of tasks that academics will be required to do, so you've got to be able to manage those and fit in your own research. Resilience, I think it's a really big one actually. Um, and certainly at the PhD level and postdoc level, you know, your work's going to be criticised, and if you're the kind of person who is shrinks at the idea of criticism or, or doesn't want to engage in that kind of debate, um, takes things very personally, it, you know, that's, if you really want an academic career, you, you're going to have to find a way to overcome that, I think, um, because it's kind of part of the, part of the deal, really. Um, presentation skills, you will be teaching, you will be giving um, posters at conferences, so uh, that's an important one. And leadership and management. Um, Again, another quote, from the earliest stages of your academic career, you will need to manage your project and start to develop, uh, develop as a leader in your research field. Um, as you progress, you're going to be responsible for supervising the PhDs of new researchers and research groups, depending on your discipline. As a lecturer, you will be seen as a leader by your undergraduate students. You're likely to have to take on the admin, as we talked about, the management roles in order to progress. So, um, these are skills which it's um, important to bear in mind that you will need and any experience or exposure to them that you can get would be, would be useful. So finally, I'm just, I mean, so, so the questions I'm supposed to ask myself at this point are, do you have or are you likely to get a good, good degree? It's a really simple one. Are you prepared to do a PhD? This is not a short route. Uh, this is a you know a minimum three year commitment. Um, a lot of working by yourself. Do you love the you know do you love the research? Do you, do you love the field? And can you communicate those ideas to other people? And can you communicate them in different ways to different kinds of people? And can you defend them in a debate? In a debate? How comfortable are you with this idea of this transition period between PhD and finding a permanent position? That could go on for some time. How do you handle long periods of uncertainty? And thinking about that period as well, are you flexible? You know, do you have you got the flexibility in your life and the kind of the mental, the emotional flexibility to say, okay, if I have to do three years in Scotland or Wales or France or wherever I happen to be, I can do that. That's fine. It's not. It's not going to be too. Um, upsetting for me or my, my life, too difficult. Obviously the passion for the subject, can you sustain your focus on the subject? Can you motivate yourself to work long hours and solve problems with minimal supervision? Um, it's harder to figure out the bachelor's stage, probably by if you're, if you're doing a master's, you'll, you'll be doing this for yourself anyway, so you'll have a sense of how, how you are with that. Can you endure the long path to establishing yourself as an academic in, in, a, in a field in which there are fewer and fewer jobs the further you go up? And, and can you handle this level of competition? Um, and, and, you know, I suppose, do, do the extra bits around the side that can help you with that, like constantly build your network, get involved in the administration that you need to get, get, uh, need to get involved in, get your name out there, get known, that sort of thing. I'm just going to finish up by saying, uh, look at the Facebook page, um, He's Got Careers, and if you'd like to come and see me, uh, you can contact me through the Facebook page. Thanks everyone.